Hello there. Let's start a new video series where I teach you about the basics of the lifestyle, a set of ground rules required before you even start dabbling with performance enhancing drugs, nootropics, metabolic modulators, anti-aging compounds, or anything else that falls under the umbrella of self-medication. In this video, I'll discuss training. I know it won't get any views. I know it won't get any likes. It'll probably lead to a boatload more entry-level questions but some of you might get it. And if I can see a light bulb go off in one of you guys or gals, then I consider this video series to be a success. Enjoy the set of rants. I know I will. Vigor Steve here. All right, so based on all of the repetitive questions that I get on a daily basis, by direct messages, by email, and even on the Vigorous q and I think it's about time to give you guys a full brain dump and explain everything that I know about the basics, about training, nutrition, supplementation, ancillaries, overall health management, performance enhancing drugs, and whatever else springs to mind. Hopefully some of you will take this advice to heart and stop asking me about mitigating side effect X, Y, Z, side effects that shouldn't be happening in the first place if you just live the lifestyle. But many of you still don't seem to understand what the lifestyle actually entails. So I'm going to break it down for you nice and easy with a couple ground rules you can easily follow. And hopefully over time, this will enrich your life, improve the quality of your life and fix some or all of the issues that you're currently facing. And you can try to fight me and debate me in the comment section all that you want. I honestly don't care what you take away from this new video series. This is a one-way communication from a 40-year-old bodybuilder to you guys. I've made plenty of mistakes, but I overcame all of them. So you can learn from my mistakes. You can continue to make your own. I honestly don't care. One way or another, you will learn. In this video, I want to focus on training because this is how we all get introduced to the fitness lifestyle. After all, without training, you shouldn't even be looking into some of the ancillaries, the supplements, or the performance enhancing drugs that I always discuss on this YouTube channel. I mean, honestly, dude, if you're not into training, you're not into exercise, physical activity, then honestly, what are you doing here, dude? So let's get started with daily fasted cardio. You should be doing a minimum of 20 minutes at least five times per week, but ideally every single day. And if you can push it to 30 minutes upon waking every single day of the week, that will be sweet. And don't give me the bullshit excuses on that you don't have time for daily fasted cardio. Make it work. You're not in a wheelchair, right? You can walk, right? You can do your daily fasted cardio five times to seven times per week. You can do multitasking while doing daily fasted cardio for 20 to 30 minutes every single day upon waking. You can watch podcasts. You can watch Netflix. You can play video games. You can uh, read up on the news. You can do so many things at the exact same time while you're doing daily fasted cardio. It should not cut into the productivity and the hours that you have limited over the day. We're talking about getting your heart rate up to 125 beats to 135 beats per minute. Zone two, zone three cardio cardio for 20 to 30 minutes. It's not the end of the world. If you have to wake up earlier, so be it. You just go to bed earlier as well. It doesn't have to cut into your overall and total sleep time or sleep quality. And this way you get the day started with something for your health first thing upon waking. You can have some coffee before you get started. You can do your injections of injectable carnitine or wherever else you prefer to optimize the fat burning during your fasted cardio that you should be doing five times to every day of the week. And if you want to throw in some high intensity interval training, maybe one to three times per week, depending on your individual recovery, then go right ahead. Just take a little bit of essential amino acids if you're below 8% or 6% body fat to prevent catabolism. It's all good with me. It's not exactly a facet state, but it's still better than sitting on your butt scrolling through Instagram or YouTube. But Steve, can I instead do post-workout cardio or walks on the beach later in the day or bang the misses right before bed? Dude, you can do all of that and daily fasted cardio. Don't be a lazy fat fucking loser. Get your daily fasted cardio in. Make sure that you focus on your health first thing in the morning. Get your obligations out of the way. If you want to do post-workout cardio extra on top of that, go right ahead. If you want to walk on the beach later in the day at sunset, go right ahead. And if you want to to miss is three f***ing rounds or five f***ing rounds, go right ahead. But the daily fasted cardio needs to be in place at least five times per week. I broke it down for you, nice and easy, with all of the benefits of daily fasted cardio. And if this is not able to convince you, then I don't know what will. 
So like I mentioned before, to get all of these benefits out of daily fasted cardio, the ideal cardio zones are between two and three, that is 60 to 80% of your maximum heart rate. You should be able to hold a conversation, but you should also be slightly out of breath. And you can cycle between zone two and zone three, let's say five minutes zone two, five minutes zone three, whatever you wanna kill your time, it's important that you get your butt on a cardio machine and do the work and do the activity. So for my, uh, my age at 40 years old, I usually hover around 125 to 135 beats per minute. The ideal cardio duration where all of the benefits are already observed are from 20 minutes onwards. From 30 minutes onwards, it's mostly fat loss. You don't always have to do that because the benefits for insulin sensitivity regarding the off season and all of the other benefits which are on the screen um, usually start to diminish the longer you do cardio. And then generally cortisol levels start to come up. So um, if you wanna do a cutting phase with two hours of cardio, go right ahead. But I hope that you're on both loads of anabolics to offset the potential catabolism from doing two hours of cardio every single day. 20 minutes gets the job done, 30 minutes is better, and after that, you probably get some diminishing returns. Why is it beneficial? Mental fortitude. Do you think I like to do a daily fasted cardio? I still do it though. Every single morning, I have my cup of coffee, I answer a couple of emails, I do a couple of injections, and then I go right down on the cardio machine. And whether that's the treadmill or the elliptical or the Stairmaster or the recumbent bike, or just walking outside, I get the job done first thing in the morning, even though it's not fun, even though I don't like doing it. I've been doing it for years to decades. I still don't like doing it, but I get it done. Mental fortitude is built the first thing in the morning. You can multitask content consumption, right? Whether that's on YouTube, Instagram, the news, whatever. I usually watch cryptocurrency news. So I set myself up for financial freedom for the 20 minutes, 30 minutes that I do daily fasted cardio because I know exactly how the market is going to respond for the rest of the day. And I can get my entries or my exits out of the cryptocurrency market and make a boatload of money. Daily fasted cardio improves your breathing and stomach control unless your stomach is full with a boatload of from the night before when you had your cheat meal or refeed, right? So you might want to do the evacuation process first. Once you get on the cardio machine, you can practice your vacuums. You can hold your abdomen in super, super tight. And it doesn't really matter which um, cardio machine you use, the elliptical, the Stairmaster, the treadmill, and even the recumbent bike. You can control your stomach, keep that tight without any in the picture and this way you keep your stomach tight for the rest of the day and obviously you can control your breathing by practicing your vacuums as well right multitasking here is key obviously you get increased fatty acid oxidation and glucose oxidation during the cardio session and increased metabolic rate and energy expenditure at rest after the cardio session now with high intensity interval training this is more pronounced compared to steady state cardio sessions, but still the improve, improvement on metabolic function during the cardio session and after the cardio session is significantly increased. And this is why you need to do it every day because how long is this metabolic increase going to last? Daily fasted cardio improves insulin sensitivity for the rest of the day because you just work through all of the glucose that was stored in skeletal muscle. It improves your digestion. Yes, who would have known? In the off season, when you're eating a boatload of food, daily fasted cardio, 20 minutes, easy peasy, improves your digestion, allows you to eat more and grow better. Daily fasted cardio enhances your mental clarity. Who would have known by improving insulin sensitivity, your blood glucose levels are now more stable. You don't have these weird roller coasters in serum glucose levels affecting your mental clarity. And this is why I do a daily fasted cardio, even though I follow a ketogenic diet, which also keeps my glucose levels extremely stable throughout the day. If I don't do it for a few days, I know that I get brain fog. And that's the last thing I want. I want to make money during the day. So first thing, daily fasted cardio, mental clarity out of my butt cheeks. And this way I get the job done for the remainder of the day. Obviously it improves cardiovascular endurance and cardiac function by increasing your heart rate to 125, 135, maybe even higher beats per minute for 20 minutes to 30 minutes, allowing to acclimatize to an ever increasing body weight during the off season. And obviously getting yourself in better cardiovascular endurance where you're doing a cutting phase. And now all of this excess body fat is slowly going away, making your body weight lighter, improving your endurance further. Of course, it increases full body blood circulation, especially if you do the elliptical or swimming or the Stairmaster. The recumbent bike might only improve blood circulation in your legs, but if you're doing a full body cardio session, then you get full body blood circulation improvements, which also improves your blood pressure. 
Yeah, so who would have known? Instead of megadosing the telmisartan or the Cialis or other kinds of blood pressure medications, why don't you do some daily fast cardio so you can manage your blood pressure accordingly? And then you can at least lower the dose of these ancillaries if they're still required when you're blasting your socks off with a boatload of gear. It improves strenuous exercise capacity. Yes, you do your daily fasted cardio. You get your heart rate up for 20 to 30 minutes. And now the workouts are easier, allowing you to train harder with a higher rep range as well, which leads to hypertrophy, making you bigger. Great, right? It increased growth hormone and glucagon secretion. This is a little bit circumstantial. If you follow a ketogenic diet or you're doing a fasted cardio after intermittent fasting, for example, or later in the week when you're completely depleted, of liver and skeletal muscle glycogen, then you might see that growth hormone levels and glucagon levels go up because you're so depleted. But um, during the off-season, that might not happen. This is why we have growth hormone in the form of exogenous sources. It in even increases stress tolerance. Yes, because you're putting yourself in a stressful state and now you basically have an adoptogen-like effect. Daily fasted cardio increases mitochondrial function and density, so no need to throw in the mitochondrial support agents, which we'll get into in this video series. Um, you can get the job done by just doing a little bit of daily fasted cardio for mitochondrial health. And it even improves sleep quality at the end of the day because you're doing something for your activity levels. You're increasing your overall metabolic expenditure first thing in the morning. And guess what? By the time you go to bed, you're actually tired. Now, there's a boatload of additional benefits of daily fasted cardio, but I could sit here for hours upon hours upon hours, and nobody has time for that. I don't want this video to end up longer than your daily fasted cardio, which you should be doing uh, this morning, but ultimately tomorrow. So, set one hour to three and a half hours per week aside to get your daily fasted cardio in for all of these benefits and resolve some of the blood pressure issues or the sleep quality issues that you're currently facing, right? All of these benefits will overlap into the other stuff that you should be doing, and then the quality of your life will slowly improve. And next up is training, the most fun part of the day. Even if you have to beat the logbook on your leg day, giving you full-blown anxiety, it's still the best part of the day in a masochistic kind of way. And that rhymes, so it must be true. And with the invention of YouTube, there are now a million and one ways to train with a million and one exercises to perform, each with a million and one nuances to execute them, making everybody more confused on how to go about their gym sessions. So let me break it down, simplify it for you with a couple of ground rules regarding your training sessions. So let me hit you with the 10 exercise commandments. Only perform exercises that work with your biomechanics. You don't need to do any fancy exercise that you found on Instagram or YouTube if it doesn't work with your biomechanics. And you can do all the exercises that you want to look silly to everybody else. Don't listen to your YouTuber saying, don't do this, do that. If it works for you, it works for you. It's going to make you grow muscle tissue. Only lift weight you can control for target number of reps. If your rep range is six to eight, aim for a weight that you can lift for six to eight reps continu continuously. We'll get to that a little bit later on. And if you like a 10 to 12 or 12 to 15, whatever rep range you want to work in, pick a weight that you control the entire way through. And if you start failing at rep eight when you're aiming for 15, then it's obviously too heavy. And if you're failing uh, not at 15 when you were aiming for eight, then, uh, well, it's obviously too light, right? So uh, set some ground rules for yourself. Pick a weight you can control for a certain amount of reps. Only do as much volume as you can recover from, which seems like a no-brainer to me, but you'll be surprised how many people take sets to failure or not train hard enough, right? They keep three reps in reserve on 25 sets and they're not growing. I wonder why, right? Some, sometimes you need to take sets to failure and sometimes you need to back off. So if your sleep is on point, your nutrition is on point, your steroids are on point, and you're taking a growth hormone and Incrolex and insulin and whatever else, right? Your recovery process is completely on point. I don't see a reason why you couldn't do 12 sets to failure per exercise. But if you're slacking in any of these apartments, maybe you need no sets to failure and need to keep a couple reps in reserve, which means you're probably not growing efficiently. Do as many sets to failure as you can recover from. Duh. Focus on full range of motion. Yes, full range of motion is king. Now, my full range of motion might be more of a range of motion than you because I've been doing full range of motion since day number one, and I focus on the stretch. Also, you should focus on time and attention. So you can do full range of motion with um, 10 sets over a five-second 
session, <laughs> but this is not the way, right? So a three second or four second negative, a pause in the hole under the stretch position, a one to two second positive, and perhaps a slight peak contraction of half a second to a full second under uh, loads. This gives you time under tension per one rep up to six, seven seconds. Maybe the entire set will last an entire minute. Yes, obviously you can't lift a super heavy weight under this time under tension with full range of motion, but the loads, the total loads and the time under tension that you'll have will lead to significant muscle gains while preventing injuries because the weight isn't too heavy. Focus on peak contraction and stretches under load, like I just said. Focus on continuous movements. So we're not going to do five reps and then take three breaths or five second pause while we're holding the weight. No, keep it in motion. Keep it in motion. If you want to stop, you can hold it at the bottom for a second or two to get an additional stretch, but then it should go up. You should be in movement the entire way through. And once you start hitting failure, you keep going. Feel free to do some partials, right? Focus on the length of partials after full range of motion is impossible. Without assistance, you know you don't need to get a spotter to get some assisted reps. If you notice that you can't do full range of motion anymore, you continue with the movement. You don't rest. You just keep it in movement and start doing partials until you can't move the weight anymore. So you might be able to aim for 12 reps, get nine full reps, three partials, and three ones in the lengthened stretch position. This will send hypertrophy signals to the moon and back. Focus on progressive overload without, 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 without. This is key to understand. Without sacrificing range of motion, time under tension, peak contraction, stretch positions, movement, continuous movement that is, and even lengthened partials. So if you're not increasing the weights, but if you're improving your ROM, your time under tension, your peak contraction, the stretch under load, the length and partials, and the overall continuation of the movement, then you're still making progress. You can make progress with the exact same dumbbells if you focus on execution for the next year, right? This is progressive overload too, because you're progressively overloading the execution of your exercise. Return your fucking weights. And as a bonus, don't scroll on Instagram. This actually kills your gains. Right? Returning your weights builds muscle too, especially if you do 10 plate leg presses, that's 20 plates in total that you need to be returning. This improves your cardiovascular endurance like nothing else, especially if you do it continuously without laying on the floor, gasping for air. And don't get me started about scrolling in between sets on social media. This has actually been scientifically shown to kill your gains. Citations down below. As a real bonus though, to enhance your recovery, use a lacrosse ball to break up the scar tissue of all the injections that you're doing on your butt cheeks or a foam roller or use a massage gun. We'll get into that, don't worry. Deep tissue massage therapy, active release therapy, grass tone technique to break apart of the scar tissue and the adhesions and loosen up the muscles and um, improve your mobility if you are not ready to do extreme stretches under load. Focus on your nutrition, your supplementation, your sleep, performance enhancing drugs and ancillaries to enhance your recovery. So for the guys and girls who can't do deep tissue massage therapy or grass tone technique or active release therapy frequently, simply because there's no suitable massage therapist in the area or it's too expensive, you can only do it once per month or once every couple of months, ideally do it every single week to work through the adhesions and the scar tissue and the other mobility issues that you're suffering from. But if you can't do that, you can't do that frequently, then look into a massage gun. This is the one I use, the Rinfo massage gun with hot and cold therapy options. Let me show it to you guys while we're on the subject, because this is now my favorite massage gun to use alongside deep tissue massage therapy. Here we are, looks very sturdy, comes with a charger, obviously, and a couple extra rubbers, just in case the rubbers inside the massage gun wear out, because if you use this every single day for 30 minutes to an hour, then well, obviously it's going to undergo a little bit of wear and tear over the next couple of months. Let me show you some of the attachments. This is basically a pitchfork. Turn it on by pressing the button on the back here for a bit. This is intensity number one. You hear that ASMR? It goes all the way up to intensity number five. The reason why I like this, because it can go right into the biceps. So you can massage this area, you can do it on your front delt, on your front chest, wherever you want it. Yes, that's how much it vibrates. <laughs> you can listen to my voice how much tension there is. And even if you press it in all the way, then it still keeps going. So it doesn't lock up. You can put a lot of pressure on this thing, right? 
Let me turn it off real quick. So you can put a lot of pressure on this thing. And with the different heads that come in this kit, you can kind of depend on how much pressure you want to put. So this one obviously goes over a much larger surface area compared to this one. I mean, this one is brutal, honestly. Let me show it to you guys. Let's turn it on. Setting one, two, three, four, five. Well, bring the pain. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, right in the shoulder, in the front delt, in case there's some adhesions. I always have a little bit of issue on the left shoulder. So you can rub it throughout the day while you're watching TV. Super convenient. Double whammy at the same time, right? Getting your massage therapy session in and watching some TV. Right here in the bicep split. Ooh, feels great. Now, my favorite thing of this Renfo massage gun is this piece. This one actually provides cold and hot. So you can see here on the front, if I press this button, the front button, it gets hot. I wish you could feel this, but let me tell you right now, actually this heats up quite a lot. So you can do hot and cold therapy on yourself. Let me turn it on. So now you can apply a little bit of hot right, to the area while massaging yourself. And again, if you want to increase the intensity, you go all the way to number five. Doesn't lock up, still hot. And obviously if you want, you can switch to the cold setting. Now it's cold, blue light. And then we turn it on again. All the way to the maximum setting. And now it's cold. So if you have a little bit of inflammation or a little micro injury, you can do hot cold therapy. Two minutes, three minutes, five minutes on hot, two to three to five minutes on cold, alternate. And then slowly over time, you can kind of help with the reduction of the inflammation in that area. So I found this thing to be absolutely great. A great addition to a suitable deep tissue massage therapist, grassland technique or active release therapist. Let me uh, turn this one off because otherwise it's going to be very, very cold. So this is a great addition to already doing massage therapy sessions every single week or maybe once per month, depending on what you can afford. And again, if you don't have access to a massage therapist, then obviously this can get the job done besides the lacrosse ball and a foam roller to a much greater extent. This is a little bit more precise. And again, with this hot and cold therapy that you um, have access to with this massage gun, obviously you get a better sense of recovery and a reduction of inflammation the more you use it. I use it every single day for the last couple of weeks now, and it's been a great addition to my recovery protocol. And in case you're interested, you want to try this Renfo massage gun for yourself, just like I've been using for myself for the last couple of weeks now, you can find the Amazon link down below in the YouTube description section, alongside the other health monitoring devices, which I also recommend. And I honestly don't care which exercises you do, which exercise science you prefer to follow. All that matters is that you bring your A game, incorporate some of these ground rules every single time that you go to the gym, so you can have the maximum intensity, the maximum range of motion, the maximum time or detention, and the maximum peak contraction or stretch under loads, so you can have the best hypertrophy signal that you can recover from using the nutrition, the sleep, and the performance and anti drugs, which we'll get into in follow-up videos. Because obviously, the more high-quality food that you eat, the better you supplement accordingly, covering any kinds of micronutrient deficiencies that you might not be getting from your diets, the better you sleep, the more you nap, the more intelligently you design your performance enhancing and ancillary protocol, the more volume, the more sets to failure, and the more recovery you can initiate even after strenuously crazy sessions five to six times per week in the gym. But I can't give you a cookie cutter blanket answer. And if you don't know how to do that, if you don't know how to piece all of that together after all of these videos are done or while well, searching this YouTube channel where I discuss everything at length anyway, this is what the coaches are for. Now I'd send maybe $200, $300, $500 a site to hire somebody to guide you through the process to get the maximum results during your fitness journey or bodybuilding journey or whatever kinds of sport journey that you're undergoing because you need something to piece it together. If you can do it by yourself, hire somebody who can do it for you. And no, I'm not accepting any bodybuilding lifestyle clients 
anymore. Sorry. Again, it's not rocket science. Just make sure that you enjoy yourself while you're going to the gym. If you have weaker body parts, focus on those first at the start of the workout and shuttle some of the volume that you would otherwise performed on a multitude of different body parts to the body parts that are now lagging, right? Besides the nutrition and the performance enhancing drugs, et cetera, to enhance your recovery, you can shuttle some of the volume from your triceps to your chest if your chest is lacking and do maybe 10 sets instead of six on your push day and then only do two sets for triceps. Yeah, it sounds silly, but this is the way. Like, you only have so much recovery capability in between your workouts. So if you shuttle some of the volume and the intensity from your triceps to your chest, you're just maintaining your triceps, but now your chest is actually finally growing, then this is the way to bring up weaker body parts, right? Design it intelligently, look at, look at it objectively, what do I want to improve? You look in the mirror, you assess where your physique is going, and if you feel certain body parts are better than other body parts, go easy on the good body parts and go harder on the weaker body parts, keeping your overall total volume the exact same. And it doesn't matter how silly your workouts end up looking to everybody else. Don't let anybody tell you how you should do your workouts. If you're in tune with your body and you figured out through self-experimentation that this particular sequence of exercises, mostly focusing on the chest and a little bit on triceps at the end, or maybe you do triceps twice per week. That's what I'm doing for an example. I don't focus on chest, two or three exercises for triceps, and then I do triceps again after shoulder day. It doesn't matter how silly your workout ends up looking, if it works for you, if you're growing, if you're making progress, then don't let anybody tell you that your workout is wrong because you're making gains. Just keep in mind that it might take 10 years for your physique to fully develop, where your stronger body parts are, let's say, 10% over the average, and your weaker body parts are only 90%, so that's 10% below the average of a collection of all of your body parts. It's going to take 10 years even with steroids in the mix, so make sure you enjoy your workouts, make sure you're having a good time when you go to the gym, because it's going to take a very, very, very long time before your physique is fully developed, so enjoy the ride. Now, that being said, if it turns out some weaker body parts can only be stimulated by exercises that are absolutely grueling and painful and might compromise your structural integrity to the point you're risking injury, if this is the only way to grow and you're getting anxiety about particular exercises, but they're making you gain copious amounts of muscle, then well, obviously the enjoyment has to be pushed to the side and you need to do what you need to do. Right? If that means that you need to do high volume, high rep, heavyweight squats twice per week, followed by walking lunges all over the gym and then sissy squats at the end, if that is what it takes to make your legs grow, suck it up and get it done. Right? It, it, I know it sucks. I undergone several of these phases myself where I'm super motivated to do all the grueling and I make phenomenal gains. And then at one point in time, you might have to ease back a little bit because the injuries are starting to add up because of the crazy volume and the crazy heavy weights and the compromised positions that you put yourself into. Hopefully you're able to sustain the muscle mass that you built during this period and recover some of the injuries by doing a deload or some deep tissue massage therapy or hyperbaric chamber, whatever you need to do, right? Or both load of peptides to heal yourself up after such a grueling phase of a training block. But sometimes, you're not going to enjoy yourself during the workout and you just need to put the pedal to the metal, become blue collar and just do what you need to do to grow weaker body parts. And then the rest of the body parts that you're training, you should be able to enjoy yourself because now your physique is fully balanced. And when you take your clothes off or at least strip down to your underwear in the gym, um, everything is there. There's nothing lacking and nobody can take away from your physique by saying, ah, this body part is not fully developed, right? You put in the work and it shows. And if you can't do that, if you can't put the pedal to the middle and become blue collar and put in the work and settle for less, don't compete, right? Don't uh, go uh, preparing for bodybuilding shows with an excuse that you can't train legs a certain way or a back a certain way or whatever a certain way. And then you have lagging body parts on states. Um, don't compete, right? Keep this physique for yourself. If you don't want to do the crazy heavy sets or the crazy, crazy heavy workouts, giving you continuous brain fog for a couple of days after each strenuous session, then don't compete, settle for less, just leave it there. Because I'm gonna be honest, I know exactly how to bring up my legs with a certain amount of volume, certain amount of drugs and a certain amount of food, but I don't wanna give myself non-alcoholic fatty liver disease again, and I don't wanna ruin my health with the copious amounts of drugs that is required. All right, so I'm settling for less a little bit. I'm still training as hard as I can, but I know my legs will never grow as good and as big and as dense and as hard and as full as throwing the kitchen sink of foods, drugs, and copious amounts of sleep 
at it, uh, reducing my overall productivity during the day. So you might have to compromise at a certain period in time, um, but if that means that my legs are 90, uh, let's say 10% below the average at 90%, and my upper body, my back, my shoulders, my triceps, whatever, is 10% above the average, I'm going to settle for less because overall, I still have a decent physique. In the end, the most enjoyable way to train, again, within the confines of the rules that I just gave you, is the most sustainable way to train because you're enjoying yourself, so you're going to do it four, five, maybe six times per week. Same as with the cardio sessions, and it doesn't really matter which kind of cardio equipment that you like to do. I prefer the elliptical and Stairmaster, but maybe you prefer the recumbent bike. Whatever cardio equipment you prefer to do five to seven times per week, just do that. <laughs> just do the one that you like to do. Same with the exercise selection. Set it up in a way that you're enjoying yourself every time you go to the gym because this process takes over a decade before you have a fully developed physique. So you might as well enjoy it. And in the time that you're not enjoying yourself, you should be doing a money making, for example, right? Work for somebody else, for, for yourself. When you go to the gym, you should have fun. Well, with the ground rules I just gave you, you shouldn't get injured. You should be able to recover from all of the volume and the intensity that you put yourself under in the gym, right, with some of the follow-up videos that we're going to discuss. And then over time, you should be able to develop a full-blown balanced physique with 10% up or down based on the average of the collection of your body parts. And you don't need sight enhancement, you don't need synthol or hyaluronic acid or GHK copper or implants for that matter, right? You should be able to develop a balanced physique with the ground rules I just gave you as long as you're having fun with it. Next, you need to be able to keep track of your progress. You can do that by keeping a training log or using one of those training applications that are now riddled on the App Store, right? Whatever you prefer, whether that's a manual in a logbook or using one of those training apps, that's entirely up to you. At least in the first couple of years, I did the same thing with a logbook. We didn't have those abs back in the day. Yeah, I started training 25 years ago, so we did it manually in a notebook. But now with those training apps, you can keep track of your training progress very, very, very easily. In the beginning, you still need to do that. Maybe as you get more experience and you follow progressive overload and you base off memory, you know exactly what you can take during that workout session, right? Uh, volume and training and intensity wise, then you don't really need to do that. Um, or you need to handicap yourself by not doing the logbook because otherwise you're just going to tear yourself apart. All right, keep track of your body weight. Now, keeping track of your body weight is reasonably straightforward. You can do that with a body weight scale, but why use a regular body weight scale when you can go with a next level body weight scale that also checks your body fat percentage, your muscle mass, and keeps track of other parameters, which you can then keep track on your phone with an application by Renfo. So the one I use, is the Renfo bodyweight scale with a boatload of different functions. And again, through Bluetooth, it connects to your phone. So let me give you a live demonstration. So I've got the Renfo bodyweight scale off camera down below. I'll show you on the app, the Renfo app that comes along with this bodyweight scale, what happens as soon as I step on it. So you can see that it starts measuring and then automatically with time, it gives you all of the measurements on your app, which you can store for later use and keep track of the trends of your body weight increase or your body weight reduction regarding your body fat percentage, regarding your body mass index. In this sense, it's very, very convenient. Instead of writing everything down manually, you just use the app to keep track of all of the changes that are happening to your body weight and everything that's related to it. So I'll put my body composition measurements of the Renfo app on the screen right now. And you might notice that my body weight is 110 kilos. Again, we're around six o'clock in the evening. So I'm a little bit heavier than what I usually am in the morning. Usually I'm about 107 kilos upon waking. My body mass index is 36 and my body fat percentage is 22. Now, unfortunately with this body weight scale, measuring the body fat levels, it might be a little bit off if you're a bodybuilder. This is a known issue for bodybuilders or men with very large muscle mass and overall high body mass index, the body, body fat percentage might be a little bit off. So if you're a smaller individual, let's say a normal uh, body composition and normal body weight for your height, then it's a lot more accurate. But for bodybuilders or strongmen or powerlifters, which are, well, larger and in charger than life, 
Uh, the body fat percentage might be uh, significantly higher than it actually is. I think that I'm about 8% body fat. On the in-body test, I'm about 8 to 10%. And with a DEXA scan, I'll probably be 12%. Um, but visually, uh, yeah, I look about 8 to 10% body fat, depending on the time of the day and the amount of water retention that I have. Now, still, you can keep track of your body fat percentage as long as it's going down. You don't see any changes to your body weight and overall a skeletal muscle or fat-free mass then obviously you know that you're making progress uh, while you're undergoing a cutting phase. Just make sure that when you fill out your personal information in the Renfo application, that you set your height and you set it to athlete's mode, which will give you a more accurate representation of your body fat percentage, your visceral fat, your body mass, and your overall body composition that you can now keep track of again with this application. It's very, very convenient. It might not be the most accurate way to keep track of everything. Of course, the body weight is going to be accurate but some of the percentages regarding your fat-free mass, your uh, body fat percentage, your visceral fat might be slightly off. Still, if you're keeping track of that over longer periods of time, you can see a clear trend shift up or down and then make the appropriate adjustments regarding your training, your nutrition, your supplementation, or your ancillaries and performance enhancing drugs. Keep track of your blood glucose levels, but we'll address that in the ancillary and performance enhancing drugs segment of this lifestyle uh, video series and um, keep track of your measurements by tracking the size of your neck, your biceps, your waist, your arms, your chest, your everything, right? Because it's very difficult to see how much progress you're making from day to day. Even if you take weekly progress pictures, even if you do a caliper test, it's good to track the measurements of your body parts. Now, personally, to be fair, up until now, I've never really kept track of my body parts measurements until Renfo sent me their smart tape measure Plus, which is a digital tape measuring device that also sends the data to the app on your phone. So this way you can keep track of the trends of your neck, your torso, your chest, your waist, your arms, your legs, your calves, and everything else that you would like to measure. So that's very convenient. I wish I was doing this sooner. So I can show you the details on the screen of all of the measurements which I took today. Basically my biceps, my arms are around 49 to 50 centimeters. My quads are about 69 to 70 centimeters and my waist, or at least at the abdomen, is 82 centimeters. And I'll convert that to inches for the guys who are interested in that. My calves are about, let's say, 45 centimeters, but a little bit of discrepancy between both sides. So I'll show you, I'll give you a little bit of a demonstration and then we'll do the neck because that's the easiest to do on camera. Okay, so right now it's 44 and a half centimeters. Hopefully you can see that. Then we'll pull this out. There we go. It already automatically turns on. You put this back in. This goes over the head. You can see here on the app that it keeps track. You press the button here, bring that down to your neck and then press save. All right. And now you should be able to go to the next measurement, but I'll save that for off-camera time. So now my neck increased by a whole centimeter to 45 and a half centimeters. So this way you can just simply keep track of all of your body uh, measurements over time. I would do it once per week, just like you would keep track of your body weight, basically once per week to see if there's a trend up or down. Hopefully over time, your neck will stay the exact same size, right? We do bodybuilding from the neck downwards, trying to keep the face and the neck intact. Not too much of a thick neck, but we want our biceps to grow. I might as well measure my left bicep, which is bigger than my right bicep. All right, so let me try to give you a live demonstration of measuring my arms while holding the application so you can see how the magic is happening as I'm measuring it. Goes right through, holding the phone, flexing the bicep, trying to adjust the best way I can. And I think that's fair. All right, flexing. Let's see. Yeah, that's about right. 48.6 centimeters. That's a little bit shorter than before, but I think if I do this uh, off camera without me trying to hold the phone, my biceps would be a little bit bigger. And obviously if I get myself a pump, if I check this post-workout, then my arms would be significantly better. Again, this is a very convenient way to keep track of your body part measurements using the Renfo Smart Tape Measure Plus. 
If you're interested, you can find the Amazon links down below in the YouTube description section. And I get it, when you do this day in, day out, years upon years on end, it might be hard to really see the difference from a day-to-day -day basis. But of course, if you take your pictures, you keep track of your body weight and your measurements, you can see a clear trend line in the progression that you're making. Just keep in mind that uh, training is cyclical, right? You might get injured at one point in time. You might go on holiday. You might stop your cycle. You might have to undergo caloric restriction to get the body fat levels off. And that means you're going to shrink. So you might lose motivation, which honestly sounds appalling to me. I'm always motivated to go to the gym and have a good workout. I mean, did you see me stop working out when I came off cycle and I reduced my calories to 2,400 calories per day to stay lean, dropping down to 92 kilos, sub 200 pounds? I still went to the gym five times, four times a week. I still did my daily fasted cardio because I love it. I love it. It doesn't matter if I'm big, I'm small, I'm lean, I'm fat. I still go to the gym. And hopefully you can find the inspiration and the motivation somewhere deep down inside to always go to the gym, right? You don't need a heartbreak. You don't need um, to be on cycle. You don't need to eat a boatload of food. You can do all of the gymming and the daily fasted cardio even when you're miserable because you're spending time on yourself and that should be the highlight of the day when you're um well not having such a good time or having a great time right it, it doesn't really matter you still need to go to the gym and get the job done because well wh why are you here otherwise watching all of my drug videos so you better fall in love with the process and enjoy the roller coaster because your body is going to be extremely dynamic undergoing a multitude of different phases big small lean fat it's all part of the process. And especially if you're undergoing a post-cycle therapy after years of performance enhancing drug use, right, to get your wife pregnant or to um, uh, come off cycle because you need to resolve a medical condition, during post-cycle therapy, that's where the winners from the losers are determined. And the guys that still go to the gym during post-cycle therapy and afterwards, when they're relying on their natural testosterone production and they're skinny and weak and frail, and uh, emotionally uh, compromised <laughs> from low testosterone and elevated estrogen levels or selective estrogen receptor modulators signaling for estrogen-like effects in the brain. Those guys persist and then when they go back on cycle, and right, maybe in the future, after they get all of their medical uh, things out of the way, those guys will still make phenomenal gains and they enjoy themselves even while off the juice. And look at it this way. Remember the lockdowns when you couldn't go to the gym? If you've ever broken bones and you couldn't go to the gym or you had your gyno removed and you couldn't go to the gym or for whatever reason, you didn't have the money to go to the gym for a certain period of time or you couldn't afford the protein or the PEDs and you decided to throw in the towel for six months and focus on finances. Remember the hole that was left behind? Remember how miserable you felt when you couldn't go to the gym when you wanted to, but were forced not to go from a pandemic or broken bones or surgery or financial issues. Hold that thought. Hold that thought for the days when you don't feel like going, but you can go. Really? <laughs> really? Remember the days that you couldn't go to the gym and now you don't feel like going for whatever reason because you're busy or tired or have anxiety to beat the logbook? Yeah. Yeah. Go to the fucking gym, you fucking lazy piece of shit because it's a privilege, it's fun, it's enjoyable, even when you don't feel so good. Once the workout is done, you'll feel absolutely amazing that you did go to the gym. All right, food for thought. Hopefully this video isn't too long. Hopefully it can inspire some of you guys to do your daily fasted cardio and uh, change your workout modalities to the point you don't get injured and make phenomenal gains. Right? The, the internet is riddled with uh, exercises and uh, training modalities and uh, volume management and uh, training apps that you can choose from. I figured it out for myself a long time ago, but hopefully you can figure it out for yourself as well. And once you get the training locked in, then you can focus on the nutrition and the supplementation, which we'll get into soon. And first we'll have to address the nutrition and then the supplementation, and then maybe later on the performance enhancing drugs. I already made a very lengthy deep dive video series about the deep sleep. I'll link that down below in case you're interested because well, deep sleep improves recovery substantially. All right. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram at Vigor Steve, Vigor's crew. You guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys, juicy as hell, because I know how to train. And I've been doing so for 25 years. Yes, that helps a lot. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. 
and I'll see you in the next video.